Welcome to Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. In this podcast, I chat to athletes, coaches, and industry professionals about their sporting journey and the lessons they've learned along the way. Guests range from Olympians to the everyday lover of sport, but the message stays the same. There is so much more to sport than what meets the eye. Make sure you hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts or follow on Spotify so you don't miss the release of each new episode. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. I'd love to hear from you. This week's guest is Tom Dade, an ultra runner who thrives off challenging himself to push beyond the limits through some extraordinary adventures. Tom and I chatted virtually last week as we were both in Melbourne experiencing lockdown number four about the incredible things that he has achieved at the age of 22 as well as some of the challenges he has faced along the way. Tom's got a strong message to believe in yourself and that you are more capable than what you think. This chat certainly inspired me so I hope you enjoy this episode. Before we jump in just a quick warning that we do briefly touch on eating disorders early in this episode. So if this is triggering for you, please feel free to skip to the seven and a half minute mark. If you do want to learn more or need assistance, there's many great organisations out there. One being the Butterfly Foundation. You can find the link to this in the show notes. Let's get into the chat with Tom. Can you tell us about your sport and how you got into it? So ultra running, obviously Mm -hmm. my sport. It was kind of a gradual way of getting into it so I'd always been a bit of a runner from when I was 12 13 or so um swimmer before that when I was a solid a bit more solid I couldn't actually run uh worked my way into running just as I leaned out accidentally and started to do pretty well um from there I did a bit of cross country at school but kind of the anxieties of that and being starting to do okay and be competitive got to me so kind of maneuvered my way out started doing other sports uh like i started getting into a bit of bodybuilding and um even boxing and then kind of when i got to 17 18 i wasn't really happy with things so i kind of thought i'd try something different and signed up for the um arthur's seat fun run to the top there yeah and i run for ages and i did a couple five k's before just to say i trained which i didn't really <laughs> And I actually did okay, and I think I came top 10 or something, which oh, wow. I was like, oh, wow, this is okay, um, and surprised myself. So I was like, oh, okay, what's next? What can I do else that, you know, I felt good and gave me a bit of confidence, and then I did my first triathlon, mm-hmm. and then I did a whole season of the TXU triathlon series, which, again, kind of got me more confidence to try new things, and then I ended up doing – completely out of nowhere deciding I was going to go over to Papua New Guinea and do Kokoda and trek Kokoda and I did that by myself forward with two locals and myself over five days and I'd never pushed myself that much or been pushed that much and realized how much I've been like leaving on the table uh, how much more I was capable of so then I got back home and after that I was like what else can I do that's going to push my limits even more which then got into mountaineering. So then I started climbing mountains and went over to try to do the highest mountain on each continent, which I'm oh. still trying to do. So I went to Europe, did Mount Elbrus, Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro, South America, Arkansas, which was, I think, 7,000 metres. And then just Cozy in Australia, which is kind of a little hill <laughs> in comparison. But then I kind of ran out of money, as you do. So I thought, well, what can I do at home that's uh, going to kind of give me that challenge and that's when I did my first UK uh, ultra marathon that's when I started doing them wow so that was back in 2019 gosh that's the, so that's the evolution I want to throw back to the start and we'll we'll make our way through so you started yeah. off as a swimmer and we we're talking a little bit before and you were kind of like that state level swimmer so you yeah. were you know quite competitive probably trained a fair bit how yeah. Did you find the evolution between swimming and then going to cross country? Because I was a swimmer and running is not yep. my favorite activity because they're very different. How did you find that? I was, I don't know if you call it lucky, but kind of lucky in a way that, you know, I was always like a, as I said before, I was a solid kid. Mm-hmm. I was, you know, I, I, and I was always, I was always, I always thought myself as fat and that kind of thing. So uh, the, I kind of older. 
and leaned out mm-hmm. into running it was kind of I actually started running I forgot to mention before before but during life saving I started mm-hmm. running before to lose weight to try and like because that was you know 13 14 you think to lose weight and get skinny and you'd run so that's what I did and I started to get okay at it and I also started to lean out which led to that crossover so like mm-hmm. that I also got anorexia at that stage too which I didn't mention before oh wow um, whilst running I was in hospital for a month but that whole transition of my body changing made that transition easier from swimming to running because mm-hmm. I was seeing my body leaner and when you're leaner it's easier to run mm-hmm. so that kind of that transition in a weird way mm-hmm. yeah as a swimmer being and it's not bigger as in the like the words fat but y- yeah. you are a little bit broader mm-hmm. I guess than runners and that like that's just the body shape that you need to be a good swimmer yeah. did you find that like although anorexia is not a um a thing to strive for and you said it, you know help it did help with that lean out was it like an obsession to get to that lean stage that mixed with your training kind of thing yeah yeah definitely and yeah I was definitely and I also yeah with the whole thing too with the uh, anorexia I was kind of I had like an image you know I still like love Rocky mm-hmm. and I saw Sylvester Stallone and that's how I wanted to look so I kind of that's what I was trying to do but that yeah it definitely um yeah I wouldn't say like yeah it's hard to explain I guess you spent a month in hospital did they help kind of reframe that mindset to more so like food is fuel mm, yeah that, yeah that definitely did and you know like I was in hospital for four weeks but that was just to physically get better yeah it helped mentally but it took you know over a year to and you still when you have it you always constantly with, with, with uh, live with it, it never mm-hmm. goes away mm-hmm. um but you learn to live with it again by looking at few uh, food as fuel mm-hmm. uh, which is obviously super important as an athlete but and going to the hospital really made me realize that I was sick. So then mm-hmm. I knew that I had to fix myself. Mm-hmm. And you kind of, you know, when you go for a goal in sports, where you, <clears throat> your swimming goal would get the states or the finals or whatever, I kind of played, played that same way of thinking of getting over anorexia. I was like, okay, um, I need to gain weight. So what do I need to do to gain weight? I need to do this, this, and this, listen to the doctors, do this, this, and this, and kind of applied that same mentality. Yeah, mentality that I learned through the sports you know swimming and running and that yeah. kind of thing yeah and I guess those lessons that you learn in the sport we'll maybe delve deeper a little bit later but like that did help transfer over to the general yeah. the general part of your life yeah definitely so you went from swimming surf life-saving and cross-country and yeah. that was all kind of in your ju- junior years like junior years. yeah and I had 42 that I played right throughout kind of in the, I did it but I, yeah I was never again it was never great or anything which is a common thing with the player yeah did you like just an interesting part is always the mindset between people who enjoy individual sports and people who mm-hmm. enjoy team sports did you find like there was a big difference like compared to your swimming and your running when you were doing footy yeah big time especially that was I, I ended up uh, quitting footy about 15 I think mm-hmm. that was when you're doing something like running or swimming solo it's just about you get to push yourself you don't have to rely on others mm-hmm. you know, or and I you know I'd always feel like you know or you don't feel bad you know if you it's all on you yeah you know whereas if I was playing footy I'd be constantly thinking about oh is the am I giving and I'm not being selfish I'm making sure I'm giving the footy to this person I'm to protect my shepherd that person and it was just different whereas yeah again with running I could just or swimming I could just apply yourself you know go after it and yeah, just mm. go for it yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's probably why I didn't do team sports is because I was like, no, like I want my result to reflect on my mm. effort or my performance, not on everyone else's. And exactly. yeah, I found a lot of individual sports are more like that. And they're like, oh, like team aspects were nice, but I, I wanted to push myself and I wanted to see what I could get by myself. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So then you said you went and did Kokoda and you mentioned that like it wasn't, anything that you've ever experienced before and you push to that next level like what was that like yeah well so for starters I'd never traveled by myself traveling to a different country was pretty different and you know that like stressed me out a bit mm-hmm. but then actually 
on the track. Um, like I try, usually you do it over seven to nine days or mm-hmm. even 12. Me being in my like silly ego, I was like, oh, I'm an athlete. I should do it in five, <laughs> carry my own gear and have my porters. So I did. I didn't really have any trekking experience um, or, you know, I did it after Red school, but that was it. I got into that very inexperienced. So, you know, two, three days of, uh, you know, you hiking or trekking about 13, 14 hours a day with a 20 kilo backpack. And I was just ruined. I thought I had nothing left. My knees were gone and mm-hmm. I was in so much like pain. If I didn't want to say anything to the two Papua New Guinea guys, they didn't come off as weak. So that I just had to really... And you know you couldn't do anything. You just rather evacuate or get to the end. So I had to you know dig really really deep, like emotionally, physically, a whole mm-hmm. lot to to get to the finish. And that's what I was like. I didn't realize that was a next level. Mm-hmm. It was like I thought I'd been trying my hardest at running and swimming, but I, I hadn't as deeper levels to it. That's crazy because like you think about you know where you get to mentally, and you would have experienced when you were swimming and you were running and it's kind of like, oh, you know, I I, I don't know if I can get through this set of 400s or I don't know if I can do this or I don't know if I can stay sub three minutes in this set of 250s or whatever whatever it is. And, you know, you're coughing and you you might vomit up some lactic acid or something and you think, oh, like I'm really working hard. I could not even imagine doing Kokoda in five days. So like in your brain, how did you keep yourself going? uh i've had to I had to break it down mm-hmm. into this, like segments into the next stops you know that was kind of in front of me which was also kind of hard because i was so naive i mean i didn't even really properly look at itinerary and this kind of thing <laughs> but um i think what actually looking back i think what helped me the most was probably two things probably the two guys I was with the two locals they didn't speak English or anything very well but they um they themselves started to get like sick and since you know I was like the western guy I had all the medications and they didn't even have shoes on they're doing it barefoot and everything you know just in the locals that's yeah. there carrying the shed and everything <laughs> um I started to help them with you know their stomach and I think that kind of took away from my own pain in mm-hmm. my head and also again going back to sports I've, I've never uh, having I've always I'd always felt myself as someone who wasn't great, but I'd always worked my ass to try and be, I'd see like my old brother who would make the nationals at East Swim stuff, do all these Pan Pacific games. And I was always like, why can't I be there? Mm-hmm. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. So I've always had that like determination at the back of my head from yeah. all those kind of insecurities that came into play during that trek, which helped yeah. get me to. Gosh. And I guess that's a really positive spin on not always being the most talented athlete is you actually do need to learn or find that inner grit to get you going and to get you through that and to get to a level that someone who might be naturally more physically capable it's that mental strength that you need to develop yeah that's a great thing yeah was that the specific moment that you were like yes like these long distance ultra marathons treks that they're for me yeah, that mountaineering. Yeah, that was, I'd say like my, since then, my life is just everything, all aspects of life has changed just drastically because that was where I decided. And then that was like, yeah, this is my passion. This is, you know, when you kind of enter like that flow state and you're yeah. like, this is, this is what I, this is me, this is what I like. I was like, this, I'm lucky I found something. You know, somebody would ever find it. But it was funny. I remember saying when I, when I got home and driving back from the airport, I was like to my parents, like, I feel like I didn't know what, but I was like, something's changed. I don't know what it is, but something's changed. And then the next couple of years has changed. A lot. It has changed. There you go. Um, <laughs> so when you were doing the highest mountains on each continent, I saw on your Instagram that there's some snow there. Like how, how do you prepare for those type of events? Um, yeah. So I wouldn't call them so much events, mm-hmm. you know, cause it's like expeditions and that kind of thing. But preparing for those is like, it's, it is harder down here because we don't have lots of snow. Yeah. You know, besides winter. But having to do like all round fitness. So, like, you know, going to gym and doing your deadlifts and your squats and your compound movements. But then also getting in long hikes and treks um, on the weekends. And then again, with my triathlons, having the fitness of like swimming and running, um, having that broad base, I feel is what's just needed you do, there's no specific energy system whatever to work i feel for obviously endurance but mm-hmm. for climbing like, these mountains and again it's not like you can do anything for the altitude you just kind of 
got to climatize and go up. But yeah, other than that, then obviously it's just skills. Like, you know, you've got to learn how to use crampons and you know, the spiky things on your shoes and you know, ice axes and all that kind of thing. Oh my gosh. That's like, it's actually incredible. Like the, and the adventures that you've had, like how old are you? 22. 22. And the things that you've done at 22, like, do you think back and go, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe I've done so much. Yeah, I can't. It's, you know, it's super, I'm just super lucky. Then remember the, uh, you know, I've done things that, like I've been you know, doing Kilimanjaro and these other mountains, you know, people in their forties and that one mountain was mm-hmm. their goal, their life. You know, and I've done, you know, numerous at this stage and 20 ultras or whatever. And then I'm on, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I can't, that's why I'm, so, I'm lucky I found uh, what I enjoy. Yeah, it's so young as well. My other thing with like the age, because I know particularly like endurance sports and ultras and even kind of like Ironmans, like all those really bigger distance Mm. things, it's usually like you have to spend years building up that base to kind of be able to complete them. So the fact that you're doing it at 22, like do you have very big plans for when you're in your 30s and 40s? Yeah, I don't say how I want to keep doing what I'm doing mm-hmm. and do is I like winning. I know there's, I mean, I've won a few and this year and, but I like just doing heaps of them, mm-hmm. you know? So I think, yeah, like this year, I think I've done, I've like done eight, eight ultras and it's, I've won four or five of them, but it's the doing them that I enjoy. Like, so I don't have massive plans to win or anything, but mm-hmm. I have big plans to try to do, you know, the, you know, the some of the renowned ones, you know, like I don't know if you've heard of Bad Water 135. Where you it's up in Death Valley, the hottest place on earth, 135 oh miles. I think it's like 55 degrees. And you know, races like that, I'd like to do one day. And obviously, with mountaineering, Mount Everest is on is one of the seven summits. So, I'd like to give that a crack. And yeah, so I have big yeah, ambitions. And English I'd like to get into ultra swimming too, the English Channel and that kind of thing. But yeah, uh, it's not it's not necessary about winning certain mm-hmm. races or just doing them doing them and completing them and going like I climbed Mount Everest. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's insane. And like, it's absolutely incredible. We've mentioned a few in terms of like some of these amazing, we're we're going to call them expeditions (laughs) that you've done. Is there any other like significant milestones? Like, have you had some, you've met, you've won a few, but has there been some that, you know, you haven't been able to finish or like some injuries along the way? Yeah. There's been some significant moments. I know like this year actually, so at the start of the year, I did, did a three ultras and I was doing well. I think I did the local one down here, two bays, 56K, I came fourth. And then I came fourth at a backyard ultra, which is where you run 6.3Ks on the hour, every hour until everyone pulls out. Wow. I ended up doing 100Ks there, which got me fourth. And then I went and did um, probably one of the most renowned mountain races, because 100, and I won that one. And then two weeks later, I was going to do another 100K. At Wilson's prom, um, and then that one I got injured, and I had the DNF. It was my first ever DNF, and pulled out at 21k, and that really hurt because mm-hmm. to me, it's it's all it's always been about mental finishing, and and that I gave up, even though I, I could have walked it and finished it, mm-hmm. but I, I decided no, I'm not walking, I'm not doing this, and pulled out, and so like I always thought my biggest strength was my willpower and not giving up, but here I was giving up, so I had to kind of it made me think and refocus of why I'm doing it, mm-hmm. what, what I'm doing, what I'm doing. And it kind of made me realize that I was, and you know, I, I got really depressed for a couple of weeks there. And it made me realize that I was basing my self-worth on just my willpower and how strong mentally I was. And that's not all life is about. It's not mm-hmm. just about one aspect. And you can, you've got to look at things different ways and from different perspectives and your perspective isn't your own, like, you know, from, someone else's they might see it as a smart idea not putting you're not injuring yourself for later on the year or but yeah for me the biggest thing was like really realizing that I was basing everything on my self-worth on how I'm mentally strong I was mm. yeah you know by proving that by finishing these races mm-hmm. I've realized and I still it's still a thing I've got to constantly work on you can't just not, it's not just an epiphany then all of a sudden you're fixed but yeah so that was a massive that was a, that was a pretty big was a, a realization for me yeah, yeah so, so what did you do like what happened in that injury like what was it so it was just pretty much like a, a overuse is like an itb issue ish mm-hmm. like it was from my um kind of my glute 
So at first I would start, I'd start running and I just had a, like a dull pain down the back of my leg. I had it during the previous race too. And I thought I just need a bit of rest, but I decided, yeah, I decided that to be, I was like, okay, let's, I can run. I can run with this. It's just a dull ache. Mm-hmm. And then it started to actually affect my gait and how I was running. I was like, oh, okay, I guess I can still do this, but it's not going to be very fun. And then it started to get to my knee and I started to get knee pain. I was like, oh, this isn't, this is no longer just muscular. This is joint. And then it just all of a sudden when I started running, it just, this didn't collapse on me, but it just, I couldn't run anymore. I could only, I couldn't, especially the down, I could only run uphill, which mm-hmm. is really weird. I could run flat or down. So it was like the stabilizers gave out or something. Yeah. So it was pretty much just walking the flats and the downs and then the yeah, up. So I was running, which is usually it's the other way around. Mm. Ultra, trying to save your legs. So then I got to 20K and I was, wasn't having fun. That's where one of the checkpoints was. I was like, oh, no, I'm not giving up. So I kept walking for another 2K. Um, and I was like, nah. That's it. I'm, I'm pulling it. The knee was just, was, I was in pain. I was having crap time and it wasn't getting any better. I think that's a smart move though, because, you know, you could have done some serious damage in completing that race. And just imagine like, if that was hurting, then imagine what would be hurting in another 60 kilometers. Like, yeah, yeah I think you, you did a good thing by pulling out. And I know I have this conversation. I'm sure you heard what Todd did a few years ago when he broke his hip. Oh, you were there. Oh, there you go. Well, yeah. So we've had lots of chats about, you know, when you feel that pain, what happens? We stop the race. It doesn't matter. <laughs> that, that was pure grit that he got to that finish. Line. But yeah, that was, yeah. I don't know if it was the smartest idea. No, but it like, obviously you've got that mental strength and I, I've mm. seen it in Todd. Like I know mm. there's something up there and that determination that you can push through those types of things. And then it kind of goes, you have to kind of question like what's actually the smart move and what do I have to prove to myself kind of thing and, and balance it out. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Definitely. It's, well, it's hard sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. Yes. I live with him. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see these troubles, but it's that same determination that gets you to do amazing things and push those boundaries, which is absolutely incredible. And like full respect to that. That's amazing so we've spoken about like a few things but is there like a few benefits that sports provided you as a person that's transferred over to other avenues in your life that's not involved in sport yeah like yeah definitely again so there's obviously the work ethic Mm -hmm. whether you're studying or working uh, towards at work it's certain time you got to do you apply yourself and you get after it something you learn from the training Mm -hmm. you know that you can lots of life then there's you got to learning to be like humble when you win mm-hmm. or when you do well so if you're successful and being humble and respectful to others like i think that's another thing and then losing like learning how to lose and how to take losses and failures mm-hmm. like teaches you how to deal with that yeah, i think that, that, that for me that would be the three and they all i guess in terms of like work they all transfer over to work like there's times that you will need to put in a lot of effort and then you might not get the result or the the recognition that you are after and you might count that as a loss but then how you handle that is actually the real strength of character and the fact that sport can teach people that and even if they're participating as a junior like the thing you know they're going to become I guess more well-rounded adults and better workers throughout their their whole life yeah no definitely you know and again it's if it teaches you how you know if it teaches you how to be humble and how to be a good person and you can interact Mm -hmm. with others better too and you're better socially accepted within group you know again if you're at work junior you know probably like my sports from being five six seven junior sports when competitive was was there but it wasn't like I want to get good to be at states was just you did to win like, mm-hmm. i learned so much of my work ethic and determination which you know then you can apply which i've applied to your studying or you know everything else to move forward yeah so, yeah definitely. definitely and like in part of that you've mentioned before the goals and the fact that you need to set goals and then work towards those that like that's part of the work ethic and knowing how to break that down and go okay, well, this is where, what I want to do and this is how I'm going to do it. And then applying yourself to do that. That's, yeah, a huge yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, again, so teaching you planning, you know, how to plan. <laughs> like, again, 
if you if you really think deeply, you can go. You can you get more and more things that it it helps. It's helped with. Mm-hmm, so. Definitely, yeah. And I don't know about you, but sometimes you can tell that people did maybe certain types of sport by the way they kind of behave or the way they handle things, yeah. or like the endurance based sports. Like you can go, okay, like they just don't stop. Like what? Just relax for a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's very true. You find you do find that they're very um yeah they, they can't stop they've got to keep to the next thing mm. <laughs> the next thing Whether, yeah. even if it's studying or writing or reading or whatever mm-hmm. it's like next what's next what's next yeah like just stop and, and enjoy it for a second <laughs> yeah and like I guess even uh, team sport people like you see how social they are in groups and you're like oh you must have done a team sport like yeah. was it footy or netball <laughs> yeah. yeah that's it yeah no definitely yeah you can really notice. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good one. Now, is there like a lesson that you've learned along the way, like from any of your experiences that you'd want to share with either, you know, your younger self, like something that you would have liked to know earlier or someone who's up and coming? Yeah, for my younger self, mm-hmm. definitely, again, going back to, I guess, Kokoda, but then, you know, you, you do that on numerous Again, like when I did the uh, Aconcagua in South America, I had to go to a similar experience um, when I was on that mountain. But um, just knowing how much more capable you are, you know, even when I was, you know, 10, 12 at, you know, at school, I wouldn't even bother trying certain things. I thought I wasn't, didn't even have a chance. So you're not even giving yourself a chance to achieve anything great because you don't realise, you know, like what you're capable of. Like if I knew what I knew now, then I might actually have might believe I could get an A at the mass test. So then I would try and work harder to get the A, you know, yeah. like put in the work. But back then I didn't have the self-belief that I could. So I didn't bother. So then it was like a, it was like a story. It was like a, it was like a self-fulfilling story. Like yeah. I was never, but that's because I just didn't realize that how much more capable we're of, like what we believe we're capable of is just our perception at the time. Mm-hmm. So if I could do that to myself or anyone else younger, that's what I'd want to do. I'd, I'd always, I thought of a thing like recently that if the best way for someone to, to grow and to learn is if you think you ask them how, what's the furthest you reckon you can run? Say they reckon 7K, then run with them. And when they get to 7K, you make them run an extra couple of Ks. Mm-hmm. And they realize, oh, I can run 9K. I can run 10. Actually, what else can I do? So, but yeah imply that to like all of life and mm-hmm. everything I knew that back when I did yeah that would have been great so that would be the number one thing for sure yeah oh, I really really like that and it's it's so true there's always something more either in your brain or in your body something more left in the tank and I remember gosh I was so young like it was my first ever swim teacher so like, I think we had to swim 10 laps of the pool or something and we were doing our endurance swim to be ticked off and the pool, I think, was only 10 metres. So maybe we were swimming 100 metres. Like it was absolutely nothing. But I remember yeah. stopping and I remember crying somewhere in the middle of that and going, I can't do it. I can't do it. And she said to me, there's always something more in the tank. And she let me have mm-hmm. a little cry on the edge. Like I couldn't touch the bottom of the pool. So like that's how little I was. Mm-hmm. And then she made me start again. And so yeah. by the end, I'd done almost, you know, an extra half of what I needed to do. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. That's it. And again, that's why it comes back to probably sports is so important as a kid. Mm-hmm. You have we have teachers like that that can teach that to you, so then you can learn from an early age. Mm-hmm. Which I'm you know, that little thing there probably helped you heaps throughout your life without even realizing. Yeah, like even in things that aren't in the sporting arena, like there's. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I've had very little sleep because we've just got the dog de-sexed and he's been, he's not an inside dog. So he's been inside and we have to go take him out for walks in the middle of the night <laughs> to go to the toilet yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And I've been dead tired on my feet, but I, in my head, I'm like, no, nope, there's always more in the tank. Like you're mm-hmm. fine. Stop complaining exactly. internally. You're fine. There's more ways more in the tank. And yeah, like I, and that's where I got it from when I was like five or six. And it was that one swim that, teacher. Definitely. Exactly. You know, it, yeah, again, it's, that's reminding myself like last week I did like my first full week of night shift where it was from 11 to 6 later Friday and I felt like absolute crap most mm-hmm. of the week but as you said from all these experiences I learned you just got to get through it you got more in the tank you can do it and mm-hmm. you can do it and coffee helps <laughs> yes definitely 
probably helps <laughs> big time you know it <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, I really, really like that lesson. And I didn't realize that that was still in my head until we've just kind of spoke. That obviously does. I think that's the thing with sports is you you don't realize the lessons you're learning. You don't, it's all subconscious. You don't Mm -hmm. realize. It's not until you think about it or talk about it. You're like, oh yeah, I learned this. You know, I'm like this because of this. Mm, Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love it. It's such a powerful tool. (laughs) And speaking of tools, has there been like a project where you've used sport as a tool to develop the community? Hmm. To be honest, I wouldn't say so. I'd say the closest thing I could say is maybe, you'd, you you know, you do a certain run and maybe it inspires a certain person or to give something a crack. Mm-hmm. You know, that would probably be the closest I'd say, but I haven't purposely done something to, you know, benefit the community. You know, 100% honest there. So, yeah, yeah, no, but even like the inspiring other people and other athletes to push to, you yeah. know, their limits or to try something that they wouldn't have thought of like that could be the turning point and go all right well imagine like what the flow-on effect of getting that person involved in the sport is yeah that's something I'm really big on now as I just so I want everyone everyone I know I want them to realize how much more capable they're of that's Mm -hmm. why my social media would be you know kind of people need to know this yeah so that would be the closest thing yeah yeah, and like the one, um, was it, what's it called? Is it the Down Under? Down Under 135, yeah. Yeah, so you did that a few weeks ago, and that is 217 kilometres. Yeah. Which is crazy. Like, I think of that, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And it the there was a cutoff time of 56 hours, and you were the second person to finish before the cutoff time. So there was two finishes, and you were one of them. How inspirational is that for someone, even any of the other people mm-hmm. who didn't finish or got cut off? Like yep. that, the fact that you could do that at the age of 22, like that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I, I suppose. I, I had a few, <laughs> yeah, I had a few people message me saying, oh, like two that didn't finish, like, oh, you made me realize it was doable. Like you two finished, so it has to be doable. Mm-hmm. I, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you were, were you supposed to be racing this weekend? Was there something this weekend? Yeah, yesterday. There was a 50K down at uh, Mount Macedon mm-hmm. that I was going to be racing, but obviously with the COVID lockdown. Yep. Missed out on that one. In September. Yeah. So, and I was supposed to be doing a 350K in a week and a half from now in South Australia, but. That's not looking like that will happen either because <laughs> no. we probably won't be able to go over the border there. So, oh, yeah, that's tough. But again, just, just like uh, as we said, through you know, as you learn through sports, you have your you get knocked over and you just got to keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. So, got to roll with the punches. <laughs> nothing you can do. In saying that, like this is where I've gone towards this question: is where do you see the future of sport? Because the future of sport is constantly changing, especially in the in the time that we're living now. So, you know, what's next for you? But what do you see like in the future of either sport in general or like ultra events and um, mountaineering? I think the adventure, kind of what I got into, the adventure outdoor seems, you know, just because of the participation and the more and more people realising that you don't have to be someone special to do it. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be the future. I really do. Like it's the participation in both mountaineering and ultra running is increasing and in trail running. You know, you see some people that, that they're not completely not super athletes. Like mm-hmm. you know, they're running, you know, maybe their fastest 10K is like 55 minutes. Like they're, they're not super, but they're finishing 50K, 100K races just because they're beginning to realize that you can just keep pushing. You know, mm-hmm. if you've got cutoffs that aren't super tight you can make it and I think that participation and people realizing that more and more are getting into it. and it's the same thing with the uh, mountaineering you know more and more people are getting into the uh, specs and hiking and just getting outdoors I think yeah realizing you don't have to be you know you, you go to a 5k or 10k fun run and it's so intense everyone's so like dialed in and really <laughs> fast run with it. and it just if it's not for everyone like people don't do it like well, I don't really like that vibe but these are these other sports, you know, like mountaineering or, or um, ultra running. It's a completely different vibe where it's everyone's there to help each other. It's mm-hmm. you know, it's competitive, but it's not like death stare competitive. Like it's a friendly competitive. It's more like of a community. 
Yeah, definitely. Like if you if you're at the finish line and you got 50 meters left and you're second and the guy who's winning is right in front of you and he falls over, you you, you probably will stop and help him. You know, yeah. oh, you know. Whereas you see on these some of these half marathons or even marathons and you see some people collapse towards the end and a hundred people just passing them. You would never mm. see that, you know, the trail running community because it's a different yeah, vibe. And I think that's what is the future is. I really do. Yeah. And I really like that because it's that community aspect of sport that's so important. It's the, you know, the belonging. And yes, you're all there doing the same thing. Like you're all there trying to get the most out of your, your own selves. And if you see someone fall, you'd, you want to pick them up because you'd want them to do the same thing if it were for you. Like you'd want to help them out and get them to that finish line. And I know there's been a few, like I think there've been Olympic races or or something where you do see the competitors either run past and you're kind of like, oh, like you can understand why, but the, the yeah. good the good yeah. thing is to pick them up. And I've seen a few where they pick them up and they get them across the finish line and you're like, yeah. like that is what good sportsmanship is and that's what it's about yeah and and yeah again you can totally understand you're an olympic athlete you've been training for four years for this Mm -hmm. event winning all hard work and managing money sponsorships a lot is weighing this and i can understand running past like no judgment but sportsmanship that you see in other sports yeah yeah I know personally, like, it's not about getting the medal. And I know, like, what would you be able to live with? And you've got to, you know, you never know until you're in the moment, but you've got to hope that whatever decision you make in the moment, you're happy with when you sit back and you reflect on it. Yeah. And it's good that, you know, the sport that you're involved in has that community and has that sportsmanship. And it's that friendly competition where, you know, you still want to push yourselves. But I guess you're probably thinking, well, if there's someone who's better than me, I'm going to push myself further because of that person. You're yeah. not going to want to just try and push them down. Like you want them to get better to push you to get better. Exactly. Yeah, hundred percent. They do better. You do better. It's just that's the whole point. Yeah. It's not you know if and if they beat you, then they're just better than you on the day. There's no mm-hmm. you know good on you. Like, <laughs> well yeah, 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 definitely. definitely. And so you've got a few events that have now been postponed. What's coming up? Like maybe for the rest of this year, pending pending the year. <laughs> yeah. No matter what, I'd like to. My big one of my big goals this year was to finish a 200 miler. Mm-hmm. Um, that's 320k, three, 320 Yeah, 320k. And I was originally signed up for one called Delirious West in February in Western Australia, but that got locked down. So mm-hmm. I couldn't do it then. And then I transferred that to the Rational South, which was this month in Western uh, South Australia, but that also got yep. locked down. I think there's another one in October that I can maybe try to transfer that I'll try again. Yes, I'd like to get that one, see if I can get in that one and finish 200 mile. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the other goal was there was, I wanted to finish the three. You can argue if it is the hardest or not, but generally consider the three hardest 100 miles in Australia in one year. So the Alpine Challenge, which I did in April, which is up around the mountains. Uh, Mount Feathertop and stuff, which had I think seven thousand five hundred meters elevation in total. Oh my gosh! Um, so did, yeah, done that one, finished that one, um, and then I just did the down under one thirty five. Um, so then there's just the in November the Great Southern Endurance Run, which is again us up in the mountains, and about twelve thousand or eleven thousand meters ascent, I think something like that. So I wanted to finish those three in a year. Yeah, I was also thinking about maybe going to. It, it's not going to happen now because international travel has gone, but going over to Ecuador to uh, climb some mountains up there, oh, not wow. part of the seven summits, but doesn't look like it's going to happen. So maybe try and get over to New Zealand, maybe. But it's sort of just maybe. Yeah. Um, and then the other one was I've also, I wanted to try and get into Rock Nest in 2022, mm-hmm. the 21K swim. That's across, that's Perth, isn't it? Yeah, that's in Perth. Yeah. Yeah, so from... Yeah, so from Perth to the Rottnest Island. So mm-hmm. um, I've got to qualify by doing a 10K swim without a wetsuit under four hours, I think, mm-hmm. in open water, which I've done 10K with the wetsuit under that time, no problem. But it's the cold that gets to me. So mm-hmm. anyway, I try and get the qualifier in December and if I'm lucky, get into the February Rottnest Channel swim. Oh, that so would be like, amazing. Yeah. yeah, that would be pretty cool. 
Yeah. <laughs> if I can, yeah but they're, yeah, they're, they're, the, they're the main girls. Oh, they yeah. all sound so cool. And like, they're all so big. And the fact that you're not just doing one of them in a year, like you've got them all lined up and you're like, I want to do this one, this one, and this one. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, as I said before, it's, it's, uh, I'm not, I'm not too fast in times or anything. I just like doing as much as much as I can. Of fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that is so good. And like your Instagram, like I've been looking through it a fair bit and it's amazing. Like some of the pictures and it's like that, just the adventure that you get to have in these, yeah. these explorations, like it's insane. So yeah, if everyone can follow you, I'll link it in the show notes because it's something pretty awesome. But yeah, no, thank you so, so much for joining us today. And I really, really appreciate it. And I can't wait to see the the, the pictures of the next adventures. No, cheers. I appreciate you having me on. And I think it's good what you're doing. I think it's getting that the message out there about sports and encouraging participation. I think it's really important. So thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. This is a completely independent podcast that has been created to share the journey and lessons of top level sporting professionals, but also your everyday lover of sport. If you liked this podcast, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a review and share it with someone who you think would also enjoy it. Until next time.